Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 15th KOJ Lecture Series. This is brought to you by the Philippine Geographical Society in partnership with the UP Department of Geography for its uh, 40th anniversary celebration. I am Oni Martinez, and I will be your moderator for this lecture. Uh, we have a few reminders before we start. We would like to remind all the participants to kindly keep your microphones on mute during our speaker's presentation. We encourage you to interact by typing your comments, um, your reactions, and questions in the chat box here at Zoom. They will be addressed during the open forum, which happens after the presentation. Please also note that this meeting is being recorded. The recording will be made available for viewing after the event through the Department of Geography YouTube channel. If you have any concerns or questions in this regard, please don't hesitate to put a comment in our chat box. For our opening remarks, let's all welcome the President of the Philippine Geographical Society, Professor Emmanuel Desi. Thank you, Oni. Magandang hapon po sa lahat. I am delighted to welcome everyone to the 15th KOJ Lecture Series for 2023. The HJ Lecture Series is a venue for highlighting works and research of our fellow geographers and geography adjacent scholars. This is also a collaboration between the UP Department of Geography and the Philippine Geographical Society as part of the 40th anniversary, uh, anniversary of the department. Um, for this afternoon's talk, our speaker will talk about Chinese criminals and the frontier in the 19th century Philippines. This lecture traces the historical geographical morphology of these territories in Philippines during the Spanish era. Um, our word cloud generated from your registration keywords include border, boundaries, uncharted, new, edge, neglected, theater, remarkable, and possibilities, and a lot more. Let us see how this all connects to this afternoon's lecture. So, muli po, maraming salamat. Thank you for joining us. And on behalf of the Philippine Geographical Society and the UP Department of Geography, Welcome to the 15th KOJ Lecture Series. Thank you, Prof. Eman. And now let me introduce our speaker who will talk about a very important no, core concept in geography, which is about frontiers. Our speaker for this afternoon, Professor Jelly A. Galang, is an Associate Professor of History at the Department of History in CSSP here in UP Diliman. He serves as the Deputy Director of the UP Third World Studies Center and Editor-in-Chief of the Chinese Studies Journal. His research interests include the 19th century Philippines, Chinese in Southeast Asia, modern history of China, and the history of crime and punishment. So without further ado, we now uh, let our uh, speaker for this afternoon, Professor Jelly Galang, uh, start with his presentation. So Jelly, magandang hapon! Magandang hapon po sa lahat. First, I would like to thank the uh, UP Department of Geography for inviting me, especially Sir Joseph Palis. When he invited me, sabi ko, ano ba yung geography-related work na nagawa ko? No? So, uh, my presentation is actually, I was able to uh, publish this uh, this work no uh, in a journal in Taiwan. No? So, if you're interested to read the 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 paper I can send you cop a uh, copy of, of the, the the paper no? so email lang kayo or mag chat lang kayo I can send it to you okay so I'll share my screen okay so my presentation this evening is uh, on Chinese criminals and the frontier in the nineteenth century. Philippines. So as mentioned by Sir uh, Ma'am Oni kanina, uh, yung term na frontier is a very geography. No? So <clears throat> when when Sir Joseph asked me to talk about something about uh, related to geography, I I can talk about something about uh, 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 yung backward, quote unquote, backward areas of the Philippines during the, the Spanish colonial period. So to be just to be in the team, no? uh, nag-effort ako na maghanap ng mapa. No? Yan ang deck ko para sa 
So it's it's a map of uh, of Mindanao. I'll be discussing this particular part of Mindanao uh, in the course of my presentation. This uh, map was taken from the Biblioteca Nacional de España in, in Madrid. So when we talk about the Chinese in Philippine history, especially during the Spanish colonial period, we uh, commonly focus on the Chinese merchants, yung mga mayayaman na Chinese. No? So Chinese merchants and their families. No? Usually we focus on their family life, their business uh, uh, activities within and outside the Philippines. This is understandable. No? This state of scholarship no? on, uh, on, on the Philippine Chinese is quite understandable because the Chinese merchants and their families produce a lot of documents about themselves, about their families. And when we talk about history, always uh, depend on what what was written about the particular topic. So sa kanila, ang daming documents about, about them, about their families, marriage contracts, birth certificates, business negotiations, etc. But I think what is lacking in the in the historiography is the other side, the other the other sector of the Chinese community in the Philippines. And this is the laboring classes. Yung mga lower class Chinese na usually obscure, nameless, inarticulate in the historical narrative. Again, similar to the Chinese merchants, this is quite understandable because these lower class Chinese were, did, did not produce any materials about themselves. No? Uh, usually lumalabas sila kapag may mga foreign observers and travelers who wrote about them and observed nila na itong Chinese cargador was doing this in, in Manila, in the provinces, this particular vendor uh, was selling this item, etc. No, but they themselves did not produce any materials about themselves compared to nyari sa mga Chinese merchants. Pero I think uh, they also deserve a space in the historical narrative. Especially those uh, laboring class Chinese who committed crimes of poverty. Hindi sabihin, kasi sobrang hirap nila, may mga policies na na-violate sila. No? So, hindi sabihin, uh, hindi lang dapat na-highlight yung mga mayaman, influential na Chinese, but also yung mga, mga poverty-stricken uh, individuals sa Chinese community. And that is uh, my motivation. We need to look into their lives and circumstances of this of this lower class Chinese, especially those uh, individuals from the laboring classes who became criminals. No? Uh, and these criminals, as I will be discussing in detail later, were punished in various ways, no? but one important way was through deportation or forced transportation of criminals to different parts of the of the Philippines, far flung areas of the Philippines. So I'll be focusing on the laboring classes who committed crimes of poverty. These were individuals who were exiled to the, the frontier areas of the Philippines. So in this presentation, I want to discuss who were these Chinese criminals. I put uh, criminals in quotation marks because the criminals, it, of course, it is a, a, a judicial legal term no? From based on what the law says. No? But if we look at the testimonies of the criminals themselves, we would, they wouldn't claim, they wouldn't say that they, they, they were criminals. They would say, I'm a cargador. I am, I, I, I am this. I'm not a criminal. No? So meron, kumbaga, for me, the term criminal is debatable. No? So you can uh, argue na sino criminal, sino hindi. Depending on who defines crime, who defines criminality and criminals. Second, I want to discuss the actors, institutions, and processes involved in the deportation process of these individuals to the frontier areas of the Philippines. And second, and last, uh, how did this deportation process contribute to the transformation of frontier areas. Now, specifically, I'll, I'll give an example later. Now, uh, uh, a deportation case that occurred in 1852-1853. Now, so my the presentation will revolve around this this question. The sources I use for this research 
are mainly from the National Archives of the Philippines, specifically the Chinos bundles. No? Uh, sa archives natin sa Manila, meron tayong 148 bundles. So you can see on the slide, ganyan ang itsura ng bundle. As in, nakabundle talaga. No? Uh, baka merong ilan sa inyo na naka-encounter na ng mga archival materials. Si Ma'am Oni yan, yung raising her hand. Uh, loose, usually loose pages siya na naka nakabundle nakabalot sa Manila paper tapos nakatali ng ng straw no uh, i was able to open all 148 bundles some of them are one each thick di ba naman ay dalawang dangkal ang thick no so depend depende no depende dun sa dun sa documents na nandoon sa mga bundles uh these bundles cover the period between 1781 and uh Uh, the end of the Spanish regime in 1898. No? Uh, for this particular uh, research, I focused on uh, criminal records. No? Kasi, sabi ko, aside from uh, uh, information from travel uh, travel books, travel logs, for instance, lumalabas din yung mga laboring class Chinese kapag naka, nakakakumit sila ng mga crimes. No? Yung, from the criminal records, arrest orders, police records, Uh, prison records, deportation, expulsion orders, yan, ang daming documents about them. No? Na, uh, itong, ang tawag dito ng social, Italian social historian na si Carlo Gidsberg ay Archives of Repression. No? So, maraming pwede makuha from these criminal records. And I was able to obtain more than 5,000 individual cases of this uh, laboring class Chinese Uh, between 1831 and 1898. So lahat, uh, I was able to trace for instance anong trabaho nila be before they were arrested. Ganyan. So their names, places of origin in China, occupation in the Philippines, age, sa, ano, anong nangyari sa kanila, etc. So I was able to compile all 5,145 individual cases no, from the from, from the bundle, from the Chinos bundles. And I focus on what the Spanish uh, colonial government called the social undesirables or mga dangerous classes, specifically vagrants, drunkards, beggars, idlers, uh, pickpockets, unemployed, uh, undocumented, and the suspicious. So itong mga, hindi sila yung, ito yung mga tinatawag na uh, crimes of poverty, nakapag-commit sila ng crimes of poverty na nagpapalaboy kasi naghahanap ng pagkain, nagbumihingi ng ng alms din or ito yung, ito yung mga tao na sometimes they call them latak ng lipunan na parang wala nang wala nang uh, uh, pag-asa no for the point of view of of the Spanish colonial government so these are the sources i use uh, for my research this is just an example no uh, i use official documents of spanish sources because i'm focusing on the 19th century so the materials i use Uh, our 19th century official document. So this is an example. no? So ito yung mismong dokumento. <clears throat> Dalawang pages lang ito, pero marami na tayong pwede makuha na, na information. So this is uh, about a Chinese. Ang pangalan niya ay si Yao Yangpo. No? Nahuli siya ng Guardia Civil Veterana. So Veteranas were the urban police, the city police of Manila during the 19th century. He was arrested for being an uh, an undocumented person, vagrant, and suspicious. So, wala siyang cedula de capitacion personal. A document, ito yung poll tax certificate required of all Chinese living in the Philippines during the 19th century. Kapag wala kang ganito, ibig sabihin, hindi ka nagbabayad ng tax. Or palaboy ka, no permanent address, kailangan ka ang pulihin. No? So, itong transcription ng document, <coughs> sorry, nakalagay dito na ito. Nahuli siya, ito yung kaso niya. Nalaman din na not, itong Chinese na to not any official, wala siyang trabaho o kahit na anong pinagkakakitaan. That's number one. Second, sin tiner bienes, wala siyang properties. At number three, wala man siyang uh, capacity no, to sustain uh, para i-provide yung daily needs niya. So ganyan siya kahirap. No? Uh, this was uh, a document in 1877. So, isa ito sa maraming mga mga individual cases na nakuha ko. So, itong si Yao Yang po was actually deported to Hulu uh, in 1877. So, ganitong materials yung dinamit. 
So before we discuss the Chinese climate, let's discuss muna natin yung context na para tis alam natin ano yung nangyayari. Uh, the 19th century was a period of profound change for the Chinese industry, so specifically in the economic domain. No? During this period, uh, the gallon trade, the economic lifeblood of the Philippines for more than two centuries was finally abolished. No? It was abolished in 1815, so wala na yung uh, pinaka-economic lifeblood ng Pilipinas. Sa, so kailangan mag ng Spanish colonial government ng paraan para masustain yung stay nila sa, sa Pilipinas. And one important shift no, was to develop yung tinatawag nilang cash crop economy. It's an agriculture-based, export-oriented economy. So before, yung galleon trade, yung mga Chinese goods, dadalhin ng mga trade, Chinese traders sa Manila. And then from Manila, they were loaded onto the galleons and then the galleon ships, dadalhin naman yan sa Acapulco sa Mexico. So may ganyan lang na uh, trading system no? for 250 years. Pero pagdating na 1820s, kailangan nang maghanap ng ibang uh, economic system. So sabi ng mga, mga Espanyol, baka pwede tayo develop yung agriculture natin and i-export natin. Sa, hindi lang sa Latin America or sa Spanish America, kundi sa iba pang bahagi no, ng, ng mundo. And that was the start of what they call cash crop economy. So agricultural crops exported to different parts of the Philippines like sugar, tobacco, abaca, uh, uh, to a certain extent, coffee, indigo, no, ito yung mga cash crops na in-export natin. So, yung ganitong class in economic development, of course, marami pang ibang development, but ito yung isa sa pinakamahalaga, which led to uh, new economic opportunities for the, the Chinese. So, parang sa, nagkaroon ng bagong mga uh, trabaho no, para sa mga, sa mga Chinese. No? Second, because of the this vibrant economic atmosphere, dumami yung mga Chinese na papasok sa Pilipinas. Uh, merchants and other laboring classes. And pangatlo, hindi lang nasa Manila. Because before before the 19th century, of course, there were also uh, pockets of, of Chinese, small numbers of, of Chinese in different urban commercial centers of the Philippines like Iloilo, uh, Cebu, uh, Sulu, for instance, kasi may, uh, dati pa meron na tayong trading relations ang Sulu at saka China. No? Pero mas dumami, lumakas yung presence nila uh, pagdating ng 19th century. Sa mga provinces, that, pagdating ng 19th century, kasi mas naging, mas naging mas, may, may ease of, of transportation na din. Eh. Yung inter-island uh, shipping ay mas, mas naging mabilis. Na, mas nagkaroon economic opportunities sa mga provinces. For instance, they would go to Bicol to obtain abaca and then bring this to Manila. They would go to Iloilo and bring, get materials from them and bring to Manila. And then from Manila, exported to, to Hong Kong, Singapore, Massachusetts, etc. So, ibig sabihin, mas dumami sila sa Pilipinas at mas marami yung presence na sa iba't ibang bahagi ng, ng Pilipinas. Specifically, dun sa mga urban commercial centers no, pagdating ng 19th century. So, itong development at ito, economic development ka, dumami yung mga Chinese, lumakas sila sa, sa colonial economy. Ang question ngayon, pagdating na 1850s, mid-19th century, the question to the Chinese question was, do we allow, this is this is from the point of view of the Spanish colonial government, do we allow the Chinese to come to the Philippines in big numbers? Or kailan ba it limit o kailan ba i-restrict ano ba yung gagawin natin nagkaroon na marami din dati ang, 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 ang naging decision was to allow them to come to the Philippines pero they had the, the, the government had to impose stricter policies specifically on these three uh, areas no? immigration, residence and mobility registration and taxation no? so sa immigration, residence and mobility all Chinese coming to the Philippines residing in the Philippines had to uh, secure documents of identification and travel. No? And about, galing sila ng Fujian sa China, kailangan nila ng passports pagpasok nila ng Pilipinas. If they want to uh, move from Manila to Iloilo, for instance, they would have to have it, uh, an internal travel permit. No? Tapos, uh, aside from that, <clears throat> kailangan din nila ng 
mag-register sa mga padrones na no? uh, merong registration pagdating nila pag lumabas sila sa mga ships merong registration sa Manila paglilipat sila ng ng province may registration ulit may registration din sa municipal level meron din registration sa barangay level so parang mas madali para sa colonial government to track no yung movement and activities of the Chinese no kung bakit meron silang documents of identification at meron at naka-register sila sa specific areas no sa sa colony bakit mahalaga ito mga bagay nito kasi for taxation purposes tax collection purposes why during the 19th century even before that the chinese paid the highest taxes in the philippines compared to the filipinos and the mestizos of course mga spanyol they were ex- ex- exempted from paying taxes pero yung mga chinese sila yung pinakamataas na tax na binabayaran sa government so isang chinese lang yung mawala sa sa registered place of residence niya na kinakabahan na yung mga uh, mga espanyol kailangan mahanap yun kasi malaking bagay na hindi siya makapagbayad ng tax. No? So yun yung yun yung context natin. So on the on the on the slide you can see the cellular decapitation personal. Ito yung kumbaga <clears throat> this was actually uh in, implemented in 1889, no? Specifically itong kapitasyon personal dot even before 1889 meron ng ibang forms, ibang mga documents of identification na nirerequire sa mga Chinese. Itong schedule na dekapitasyon personal, ito yung full tax certificate ng mga Chinese. So, uh, meron iba't ibang tax classification depending on the uh, expected annual income no, ng mga Chinese. At uh, pagdating ng la- latter part of the 19th century, ang laboring class Chinese ay nasa sixth pang anin na tax classification. Before uh, 1880, 1889, ang tax classification ng mga laboring classes ay fourth. Pero lahat yan ay dulo. No? Yung first three, for instance, ay para sa mga merchants, ng mga mayaman. Ito namang, pagdating ng 1880 na yung mga mayayaman na Chinese ay first five. First five. Yung sixth ay laboring classes. No? So you can see here, ito yung kapitasyon personal ni uh, Yu Lingko no? sa probinsya de Cavite, Pueblo de Silang. No, siya ay galing sa Chinkan in Fujian, China, soltero, bachelor, walang asawa. Uh, so siya ay six, six uh, tax classification. Ito ay 1891. So ang punto natin ay nagkaroon economic, a vibrant economic atmosphere sa Pilipinas. Dumami ang mga Chinese, kinabahan yung mga, mga Espanyol so they had to impose stricter policies, particularly related to this Uh, areas na migration, registration, and taxation. Ang problema, maraming mga lower class Chinese ang hindi kayang magbayad ng tax. No? Kasi nga, uh, marami sa kanila walang trabaho, marami sa kanila may trabaho, pero maliit yung sweldo or irregular, marami sa kanila ay temporary lang yung work. No? So, hindi sila makapagbayad ng tax. So, pag hindi sila nakapagbayad ng tax, hindi sila mabibigyan ng sedula. No? Kasi yun yung patunay na nakapagbayad ka at nakaregister kasi sa particular area no, sa, sa Pilipinas. So, this was the reason, this was one of the reasons why Chinese criminals, quote in quote, emerged during the 19th century. Marami sa kanila ay, ay unemployed. They were unable to pay their taxes. Marami sa kanila no permanent address, uh, palagi silang palaboy kasi naghahanap sila ng employment. Many of them would live in abandoned buildings or usually sa market kung saan sila pwede makahanap ng, ng trabaho like magiging cargador, magiging porters. Many of them would resort to begging, stealing. Karanihan sa mga ninanakaw nila yung mga pagkain or mga uh, damit. Uh, kasi nga wala silang pambili ng pagkain wala silang pambili ng damit pickpocket na nag-uumit sila ng mga pagkain o yung mga maliit na bagay na para pwede nilang ibenta at makabili ng mga daily needs nila many of them would start engaging in uh, vices like uh, drinking uh, opium use no? na itong opium use yung, yung liquor, yung opium na gagamitin nila uutangin din nila kadalasan sa mga amo nila may mga amo sila, yung mga employed or marginally employed na mga 
uh, Chinese uutang sa mga amo kasi hindi na mababayaran hanggang sa magnanakaw sila. Okay. So itong, itong mga lower class Chinese na to, they would be invariably arrested, uh, fined, imprisoned. Many of them would be expelled from the Philippines, but there were also uh, individuals who were deported to frontier areas of the, of the colonies. So I'll be focusing on the, uh, those who were deported to frontier areas. Uh, when we talk about deportation no, in in world and Philippine history, hindi na actually hindi ito exclusive sa sa Pilipinas. Actually, even during the early modern period, uh, Western powers use uh, deportation no, to punish uh, and to rehabilitate uh, criminals, no, yung mga, mga, mga individuals deemed criminals by the state. No, so in in literature. Usually, ang term na ginagamit ay banishment, ex exile, forced uh, transportation, no? or deportation. Again, no? uh, the reasons why the uh, criminals were deported was, number one, uh, to punish them. Number two is to rehabilitate their wayward, wayward uh, uh, way of life. And number three is to use them no, to colonize the frontier to populate unpopulated unpacified territories no? in the case of uh, the philippines during the 19th century pag sinabing deporta deportacion uh, kadalasan ito ay within the spanish empire no uh, it meron kasing mga uh, political dissidents for instance na cubans na ipapadala from Cuba papuntang Pilipinas, meron din namang mga Filipino political dissidents na ipapatapon sa iba pang bahagi ng Spanish Empire. No? So within the Spanish Empire. No? And then also within the Philippines. No? So sa loob ng, ng Pilipinas. Ang trend usually was that kapag ang mga criminals ay nakukuli sa Luzon, ang ginagawa ay pinapatapon sa Visayas or sa Mindanao. Pag nahuhuli naman yung mga criminals na sa Visayas or Mindanao, pinapatapon naman sila sa Luzon. So parang baliktad no? yung, yung, yung uh, pattern ng pag, pag, pagbibigo. No? So generally, yung mga dinideport sa Pilipinas during the 19th century, dalawa. No? Political dissidents, yung mga kasama dun sa mga revolts, mga rebellions, no? mga social uprisings. No? at saka yung mga social undesirables. Dito sa second classification, kung nakapasok yung mga uh, Chinese criminals na binabanggit natin. No? So itong picture na to si Maron, si Maron ito yung mga <clears throat> Pilipinos na lumalaban sa government at nagtatago sa mga kabundukan. Kapag nahuli sila, ipapatap, of course, i-imprison sila, some of them would be executed, pero meron din pinapatapon sa ilo pang bahagi ng Pilipinas. At yung pagpapatapon kadalasan ay sa mga fronteras, mga frontier, Philippine frontier. So, uh, sa context ng Philippine history, 19th century Philippines, uh, when you say fronteras or frontier, dalawa yan. Number one, at ah, tatlo yan, tatlong, tatlong ibig sabihin. These were areas, number one, beyond the direct control of Spanish authorities. Ibig sabihin, yung mga areas na hindi pa ganoon kalakas, hindi pa napapacify na no, occupy ng mga Spanish uh, authorities. No? Nandun pa rin yung uh, paglaban no? uh, sa Spanish uh, authority. No? Yung second, kadalasan ito rin may kinalaman sa mga uh, heartland areas of the colony na newly acquired territories. Kadalasan ito yung uh, uh, na nasakop na pero bagong-bago pa lang. Kailangan pa rin ng mga tao na magsusustain doon sa uh, pacification efforts no ng Spanish uh, uh, authorities. And number three, ito yung mga areas na malalayo pero sa tingin ng mga Espanyol ay merong economic potential. No, na kailangan lang i-develop yung agriculture for instance, kailangan i-develop yung ano yung posibleng livelihood ng mga tao na pwede pang ma-develop ng mga tao, mga deportees, mga deportados no, na dadalhin from 
uh, one area of the Philippines papunta dito sa mga fronteras. In the context of the 19th century Philippines, pag, pinag- pag sinabing frontier, frontera, tatlo yan. Ito ay yung Mindanao, Sulu at Palawan. No? Particularly sa mga criminals na nahukuli sa Luzon. At sa, sa tatlong mega regions na yan, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, ang pinakamalakas of course na control na mga Espanyol ay nasa Luzon. So karamihan sa kanila ipapadala dito sa frontier areas nito. Mindanao, Sulu, and Palawan. Of course, frontier from the point of view of the Spaniards. Bakit? Kasi itong tatlong lugar na ito, Mindanao, Sulu, and Palawan, mahina yung political and military control of the Spaniards. Even uh, even during the, the 19th century, no? ibig sabihin, na may presence na sila dyan sa mga lugar na yan, pero hindi ganoon kalakas kung ikukumpara natin halimbawa doon sa kapangyarihan nila sa Luzon at sa Visayas. No? So itong mga deportados na to uh, function no, as pioneer settlers, agriculturists, and laborers. At sila yung gagamitin ng mga Filipinos, Chinese, and other foreigners no, para i- i-populate, i-pacify yung mga frontier areas na na ito. Uh, maliit lang kung tutuusin yung uh, number of Chinese no na i-deport no uh, more than a little more than a hundred lang yung nakuha kong documents from 1837 to 1882 no bakit 1882 yung end uh, 1883 kasi nag-shift yung policy ng colonial government instead of deporting Chinese criminals to the frontiers, nakita nila na baka mas maganda na lang na i-expel sila from the Philippines. So may ganyan silang policy. Kasi 1880s, ito yung anti height of uh, the anti-Chinese campaigns in the Philippines. 1880s yan. So uh, for, for the authorities, it would be easier uh, to expel the the Chinese the Chinese criminals from the Philippines instead of deporting them within uh, the, the within the the Philippines so yung yung study na ito meron na kung 119 cases na uh, uh, makita natin doon sa cases na na ito na karamihan sa kanila ay uh, part na fourth class tax classification na no? uh, ito yung lower class Chinese. So, doon sa 119, 103 yung nagsabi na they belong to the fourth uh, tax classification, meaning they, they belong to the uh, laboring classes. No? Isa lang yung nagsabi na merchant class, mer- merchant siya, no? third class. The others, no? uh, binanggit nila specifically kung anong trabaho ng cargador, servant, barber, the laborer, unemployed vendor, etc. No? So, ito yung Uh, basis no ng uh, uh, study na pa 119 cases no? so makita nyo rin dito yung destination no 119 Chinese criminals no? majority of them were deported to Cagayan and Nueva Vizcaya why Cagayan and Nueva Vizcaya kasi merong tobacco monopoly ang ang uh, ang mga Espanyol no sa sa Cagayan no? so magiging beneficial for the government kapag itinatapon itong mga criminals na ito sa Northern Luzon, sa Cagayan at Northern Siva. Uh, from the point of view of the, the Spanish authorities, despite the fact na meron marami ng tao sa Cagayan at Northern Siva, frontier pa din ito. Kasi kailangan pa rin mas mag-develop yung agriculture nitong area ng Cagayan at Northern Siva. No? The rest ay ipapadala sa Mindanao. No? Sa Cotabato, sa hulo at saka sa Sambuanga. May 18 ako na nahanap pero hindi nilagay kung saan specifically. Ang, kadal, ang nakalagay lang is uh, uh, in the southern region of the Philippines. Yung not available din ng 18 na Chinese kayo nakalagay lang na southern part of the Philippines. So, pwedeng Patabato, Hulo, Sambuanga or Davao yung pinagtapunan dito sa 18 na not available yung destination nila. 
I I I highlighted pa taba to kasi ito yung gusto kong i-highlight. Now, this is a case, uh, a case, very interesting case kasi ang kapal ng document from the time na nahuli yung mga criminals hanggang si pinatapon sila hanggang sa after noong uh, period no na dapat nandoon sila sa Cotabato uh, intact yung document so makapal yung documentation about this particular group of Chinese deportado so Chinese criminals who were deported to the frontier no yung sa Pulok Cotabato so noong July 1853 merong nahuli na 34 Chinese in Tundo uh, majority of them 30 33 of them uh, belong to the fourth tax category. No? They belong to the laboring class. So makita nyo yung pangalan ng lahat ng 34 Chinese na nahuli noong 1852. No? Lahat sila ay nasa fourth tax classification except isa lang, si Mariano Got Hyo Hyo Hyo. No? Uh, number 30, 32. No? Makikita nyo Mariano sa Chinese, uh, Christian, Christian Chinese. The rest ay uh, non-Christian Chinese. So itong si Mariano, number 32, siya lang yung merchant Chinese na hindi nakapagbayad ng, ng tax. No? During the investigation and during the trial headed by the gobernador Sino de Sanglies, no? the highest representative of the Chinese community in the Philippines during that time, ang sabi palagi nila ay pobre sila, mahirap sila, wala silang wala silang trabaho, kung may trabaho man sila, insufficient yung wages na nare-receive nila, kaya hindi sila makapagbayad ng, ng, ng taxes. Majority of them had no guarantors. No? Guarantor kasi pag meron kang makuhang figure na magsasabi na oh, ako muna yung magbabayad ng tax niyan, ng tao na yan, sige, palayaan nyo na, okay na yan sa government. Kasi kaya ang mahalaga sa government yung pera na makuha from, the, from, from, from these people. No? Pero majority of them had no fiadores. Uh, 30 of them walang walang gustong magbayad, magpiyansa in a way sa kanila. Yung apat, uh, yung apat lang yung may fiador, may, may, may guarantor. So yung 30, 30 na hindi mo kapagbayad, sila yung i-deport. Yung first na, na, na plan was to deport these 30 Chinese criminals to Cagayan and Nuevo Vizcaya para sa uh, tobacco monopoly. But apparently, the government had no enough funds to to bring these criminals to to northern Luzon due to military campaigns na meron sa southern uh, southern uh, Philippines. So, sabi ng colonial government instead na sa north ipadala, ipadala na lang natin dito sa frontier area no sa Pulok Cotabato, no. Uh, during the mid 19th century 1848 to 1852 unti-unting lumalakas yung mga Espanyol dito sa area ng Mindanao. No? And pagdating na 1852, the Spaniards were able to establish a strong foothold in Sambuanga, in Davao, and in Cotabato. Actually, 1852 lang nila napasok ang Cotabato. So if we look at ito yung Mindanao, yeah. so et, ito yung pinagkuhanan ito nung 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 uh, slide no para sa sa deck. So ito, so nandito yung Sambuanga, nandito yung Davao at nandito naman yung Cotabato. Na sabi ng ng government, ipadala natin sila sa Pulok Cotabato. So yung may red star yan yung Pulok Cotabato kasi kailangan na mapacify yung at least uh, three fourths ng islands ng island of Mindanao. So meron na sila dito sa Sambuanga na 1850 nakuha na nila ang Davao in this area. 1852 nakuha na nila ang Pulok Patabato. So kailangan ngayon nilang magdala ng mga deportados dito sa area na to. Sabi ni Orbiston to Governor General Orbiston do ang ang purpose ng mga Chinese criminals nito na ipap na deport sa Pulok Patabato na 1853 was to occupy this newly acquired territory. They would construct military and naval uh, fortifications kasi meron pa rin mga lumalaban na mga lumans at meron pa rin mga Muslim uh, groups no na uh, lumalaban no doon sa uh, presence ng mga Spaniel dito sa area na to and also to help in the development of agriculture in in this part of Mindanao no so ang idea was uh, mag-stay itong mga Chinese criminals na to sa Pulok, Cotabato uh, for at least three years. Now, after that, pwede na silang bumalik ng Manila sa, sa Tondo kasi sa, dun, sa Tondo sila galing or pwede rin silang mag-stay na sa area. And many of them 
uh, actually all of them would stay in the area. Pagkatapos ng three years, 1856, 1857, nandun pa rin sila sa area. Many of them married local women, mga Muslim women, at magtitake group na sila dito sa area ng 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 Pulok, Pulok Cotabato. So, very interesting story from the time they were arrested, they they were tried, they were deported and then image uh, and, and then after their term uh a prison term nandoon pa din sila, no? Pagdating ng ng mga Jesuits, no, no 1850s tapos nagkaroon sila ng mga missions dito sa area ng Cotabato. Merong isang report, no, mga mga ng mga missionaries no 1865 at sinasabi nila na merong mga Chinese no Chinese dito sa area ng Pulok sa Cotabato na uh, nagpakasal sa mga Moro women. At dito sa report na ito ng mga Jesuit missionaries, sinasabi nila na posible na itong mga Chinese na to ay itong mga Chinese na dinipot no uh, during the earlier period na dahil sa nakita nila yung potential ng area nakapag-asawa na sila ng mga Muslim women, nagtayo na sila ng mga families, they, they developed the agriculture in the area and they also became crucial actors no, in the economic life of of uh, Cotabato, no? specifically during the 1860s. No? So in conclusion, masyadong mahaba yung discussion natin, so we can see that uh, during the 19th century, the Spanish colonial government impose stricter colonial policies upon the, the Chinese. Second, many working class Chinese were not able to comply with this, this policy. So they became criminal no? kasi hindi sila makapag-register, makapag-buy ng tax, wala silang documents kasi pag nag-file sila, nag-humingi nag sila ng documents, that means they had to pay their taxes and other financial obligations to the state. So these Chinese criminals were arrested, fined, imprisoned, expelled, or they were deport, deported to frontier areas of the Philippines. No? And deportation in this context, deportation to the frontier, was meant to punish and rehabilitate these criminals, as well as to use them as convict workers, no? working to working to, uh, uh, to, to, to install military facilities, no? and as pioneer settlers. So it developed the agriculture and other commercial activities in the uh, area. So, yun lamang po. Maraming salamat po sa lahat. Kung, kung, kung interested kayo doon sa research, I can send no copy sa ating mga kami. So, maraming salamat po sa lahat. Salamat po, Jenny, sa iyong uh, uh, malinaw no, na presentasyon tungkol sa mga deportado na Uh, criminal Chinese uh, ng panahon ito ng late uh, 19th century. Uh, baka meron tayong mga tanong mula sa ating audience. Uh, bukas na po ang ating uh, programa para po sa inyong mga comments or tanong. Uh, pwede niyo po i-raise sa chat box or pwede rin po kayong mag-raise ng inyong kamay para ma-acknowledge namin. And uh, we can call you so that you can turn on your microphone and make your comments or ask questions. Meron po ba mga tanong? Kasi kung ano, baka pwedeng mauna na ako, sir. <laughs> Ayan, si Basil muna. O, sige. Basil, ikaw muna. Hi, Basil. Magandang gabi. Good evening po. Um, I have a question. Because um, I remember reading that um, Benguet was also sort of a newly conquered territory of the Spanish, at least in the late Spanish period. Were there also Chinese who were deported there? or need to do some activity in that in the region during those times sagutin ko na ba ma'am only or wait natin sila lahat so uh, go ahead uh, we, ah. we can respond to that okay thank you so much basil for that question that, that's very interesting no uh, the spanish colonial government uh tried to penetrate Tenget and in the Cordilleras in, in general during the 19th century. Although very it was a very challenging task no, no, for them, especially because of the terrain, because of the Igorot's uh, uh, um, waging war against the, the Spaniards. No? But uh, there were a, uh, areas in in, in, in in Lepanto actually no, that they were able to Occupy, no. 
uh, specifically for instance mangkayan mangkayan in in Benguet no uh, meron kasing na discover na na copper copper mines sa mangkayan uh, Lepanto sa Benguet no so uh, pagdating ito na 1850s hanggang 1880s na 1856 yung start ng copper mining sa Lepanto na sa mangkayan Benguet Uh, so ang, ga- ang gagamitin actually nila ay mga Chinese workers. So there were Chinese workers who were sent to Benguet during the 19th century but not as deportados but as contracted workers. No? May, may, meron kasing private uh, Spanish uh, mining company no? na humingi ng permission sa government na sila yung magmamine doon sa area na ito. No? Uh, at ang ginamit nila ng mga uh, workers ay, actually, marami silang ginamit. No? Meron silang mga igurots, of course, igurots, tingvians, ilocanos, uh, and then may mga Chinese na mga miners. Yung mga may hirap na mga trabaho, yung mga subterranean uh, sa underground work, uh, mining mining work, binibigay yan sa mga Chinese. Yung mga of, on the ground, mga surface work, mga igorots, ilokanos, tingian ang gumagawa. So, merong mga idinala ng mga Chinese workers but not as convict workers, not as deportados, pero mga mga contracted ng mga Chinese workers. Sa Benguet. Thank you. Salamat, Sir Jelly. Thank you, Sir. Salamat. Salamat din kay uh, Basil. Ayan. Meron po nga tanong din na uh, nakarating sa akin na uh, kung meron pang visible Chinese community, um, where is this? Ang gali lang, sir. Natin ko lang po. Is there still a visible Chinese community? In, I have to scan. In Cotabato. Cotabato, ayan. Okay, sorry, sir. Thank you. Yeah, that's the first uh, question. Is there still a visible Chinese community in Cotabato? Yes, yes. Kasi yung area na halimbawa sa kaso ng Pulok, this was the tawag dito, this was the closest part of Cotabato sa Sambuanga. Parang Sambuak, Sambuanga and then Ilana Bay and then you have Cotabato na eh. So, mas madali yung movement from Sambuanga to, to, to Cotabato. At marami sa mga mga taga uh, Chinese in Sambuanga and Sulu kunyari uh, dadaan sila ng Sambuanga muna and then to Ilana Bay papunta ng Cotabato. So uh, marami sa kanila yung makakapasok ng Cotabato and until now meron, meron pa din sila. Mas madaming papasok particularly sa panahon ng mga Amerikano. Uh, pero yung mga Chinese na papasok sa Cotabato hindi sila galing ng Luzon at Visayas. Usually, galing sila ng uh, Sambu- Sulu, Sambuanga, Singapore, Labuan, Northern Borne- Borneo. Doon sa baba, hindi sila sa taas. Hindi sila Luzon, Visayas. Karamihan sa kanila would come from the south. Si- Singapore, Labuan, Sandakan, North Borneo. Then sila papasok. Tapos, even during this, the, the American colonial period kasi, Mahina din yung pagkontrol nila dito sa area. Very porous yung border between Mindanao and other parts of maritime Southeast Asia. So, mas mabilis pumasok sa, sa Buanga, sa, sa Kutabato. Yung second na bang, ma'am Oni, is it possible that there were also criminals that were deported to Siasi? Siasi is in Sulu, no? And eventually lived there for good. Uh, yes. Uh, nabanggit ko kanina yung hulo, no? But Marami din yung nakalagay. Of course, Sulu kasi parang capital of the Sulu archipelago. But there were also those Chinese who were uh, deported to other parts of the Sulu archipelago, including Siasi. No? Uh, ang challenge ng, uh, uh, the challenge for the, the Spanish colonial authorities was that masyadong malapit ang Siasi sa Singapore. Eh. So, at sinasabi na may mga transnational networks ang mga Chinese sa southern part of the Philippines at sa Singapore. So possibly daw at, at least from the from 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 official records ay sabi na lang baka daw yung mga galing ng Hulu uh, mga Chinese sa Hulu 
uh, Siasi and other parts of the uh, Sulu Archipelago ay magtago sa Singapore and other other areas no, sa maritime South Asia. Kasi meron yung network, ma- transnational networks yung mga Chinese. So, uh, eh, mahina pa din even after yung mga treaty with the Sultan of Sulu pagdating na 1850s, 1851, 1852, nandun pa din yung uh, protracted war ng, ng Sulu Sultan against the the, the Spanish authorities. No? Kaya, uh, may, may ganun. May ganun na the feeling no yung insecurity yung mga 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 spend but definitely meron marami sa kanila that's one point and also kasi uh, meron ng trading connection trading and diplomatic relations ang Sulu uh, with with China even before the Spanish colonial regime so meron na talagang malinaw na network no itong Sulu archipelago at yung yung China uh, so meron ka ng ganoong movement no? so even kahit sabihin natin, hindi yung mga Chinese criminals yung dinitwork, meron mga Chinese na papasok because of yung early uh, connection, commercial, diplomatic uh, relations between Sulu and, and, and China. At si Brandon, sudyante ko ito. Yes, sir. Uh, to what extent uh-huh. do okay. we know of the actual number of Chinese in the Philippines in this time? What were the methods that ended in the Philippines? Legal and legal. Okay. Yung actual number of Chinese... Okay, compared to the early modern period before the 19th century, the Spanish colonial government uh mas mas uh, how do you say it? mas complex yung bureaucracy ng ng Spanish colonial government during the 19th century. Mas systematic yung census making nila, yung collection of data mas maayos pagdating ng 19th century kesa doon sa period before the 19th century. So, uh, before the 19th century, maka-approximate sila, estimates lang yung binibigay na bawa. Around 12,000 Chinese. Pero yung specific, wala talaga. Pero pagdating ng 19th century, kasi kailangan ng mga mga Espanyol ng additional revenue. Kasi nga, wala na yung gallon trade. Kailangan every Chinese ay ma-account nila kasi yung Chinese na yan, magbabayad ng tax yan. Uh, doon sa mga documents na nakuha ko, isang isang kunyari, isang Chinese lang na nawala doon sa padron o sa register sa isang bayan sa Tarlac kunyari ng 19th century. Ang gagawin kunyari ng na Mungkada, kunyari Mungkada Tarlac. Ang gagawin ng gobernador silyo ng Mungkada Tarlac, susulat siya sa lahat ng mga gobernador silyo sa Tarlac para hanapin yung nag-iisang Chinese na nawawala doon sa Mungkada Tarlac. Pag sinabi ng mga gobernador silos within the Tarlac province na wala, hindi namin mahanap dito, susulat yung, yung gobernador silyo of Mungkada Tarlac sa lahat ng alcaldes mayores sa mga probinsya na nakapaligid sa Tarlac. Ito ay isang Chinese lang yung nawawala. Pero ganoon ka, ka rigorous kumaga yung manhunt operation na gagawin niya para mahanap yung nag-iisang Chinese na dito. Kasi para sa colonial government, isang Chinese na mawala, malaking bagay ang kawalan sa wedding nila. So, kailangan nila ngayon malaman yung nasaan yung mga Chinese at ilan lahat yung mga Chinese. Uh, pagdating ng 1890, ang official na number ng mga Chinese ay umaabot ng 44,000. Pero yun ay based doon sa records ng mga treasury department sa iba't ibang mga provinces. Officially, meaning hindi kasama dun sa 44,000 Chinese noong 1890, yung mga Chinese na pumapasok illegally sa Pilipinas. Saan sila pumapasok? Usually sa north, pumapasok sila via Apari, sa Cagayan. That's one entry point. Yung isa na mga entry point nila would be sa Buanga. Yan yung backdoor route na binabanggit nila. Even during the American colonial period, hirap na hirap yung mga Amerikano na It, 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 ayusin yung pagpasok ng legal uh, Chinese no uh, via Southern Philippines. No? Until 1946, problema yan ng colonial government. Maraming mga illegal Chinese na pumapasok sa, sa Sulu, sa Mbuanga. And from sa Mbuanga, pasok sila sa interior ng Mindanao and then from Mindanao, akyat sila ng Cebu, Iloilo, and other parts of, of the Philippines. Sana nasagot ko, Brano. Si Brano sa Jantico ng Modern East Asia. 
There's one question pa sir sa ating uh, are, there, are there any sources on Chinese organized criminal activity at this time? Perhaps those involved in illegal opium trade. <clears throat> uh, organized criminal activity. There were gangs. There were Chinese gangs in Manila and Iloilo in the 1860s, 1870s. No? Pero hindi sila gangs meaning kasi kadalasan ang idea ng gang in, in the in the context of Philippine Chinese uh, ang idea nila is gaganti sila kunyari parang hindi sila hindi yung robbery or kundi gaganti sila doon sa mga umapi doon sa mga quote unquote brothers nila or member ng mga gangs nila so yun yung 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 yun yung crime na 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 naging malaking issue kasi nga dahil sa opium na pasok ng mga British ang China no because of the first opium war 1838 and then 1842 and that was the the start no 1843 would be the start of the era of unequal treaties between China and other European powers so malaking issue yung opium so sa panahon ng mga Espanyol sa Pilipinas ang tanong nila do we allow opium trade in the Philippines yun yung question so and dami dami mga Chinese dala nila yung opium sa Pilipinas. Ang tawag sa opium sa Pilipinas ay anfion, no? So dalawa yung dalawa, dalsa dalawang bagay nila tinignan yung issue ng opium. Number one is economic or morality. Morality, Christian tayo, Catholic, Catholico tayo, tapos papabayaan natin magkaroon ng mga um, opium addicts. Dapat hindi ganoon, okay? Right? Isa naman economic. Eh pag Pinayagan natin gumamit ng opium mga Chinese, magbabayad sila ng tax, kaya dahil magbabayad uh, additional revenue for, for the government. So ano ang nanaig? Economic. Pinayagan ng mga Espanyol na pumasok ang opium sa Pilipinas, pero so nandun pa rin yung moral uh, moral issue. No? Sabi nila, papayagan natin pumasok ang opium sa Pilipinas, pero hindi pwedeng gumamit yung mga Pilipinas. So, opium use was exclusively for the Chinese. So, bayaan natin muling adik yung mga Chinese. Ang mga Pilipino hindi pwede yan. So, that was the reason why in Manila and other urban commercial centers of the Philippines, merong mga opium contractors, mga mayayamang Chinese and Chinese mistis or businessmen who establish opium dens sa, sa iba't ibang bahagi ng, 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 ng Pilipinas. So, maraming mga sources tungkol sa antyon sa Pilipinas. At pag sinabi antyon, business yan ng mga antyon. So do, may, may maraming bundles sa National Archives of the Philippines na ang pangalan ng bundles ay antyon o opium. So if you're interested in that, yeah, maraming documents, makita mo yung saan yung mga opium din. Sino yung nag-operate ng mga opium, opium din. Gaano kadami yung opium na ipinapasok sa Pilipinas at lumalabas uh, pumapunta sa iba't ibang bahagi ng Pilipinas. So Jelly, yes. um, there's also a question uh, here. Um, sabi niya ay since okay, the yeah. Chinese uh, no, another question uh, ah, okay. sent to me uh, privately. Since the deported Chinese criminals were uh, there deported to cultivate agricultural sector, uh, were they given titles or lands when the Spanish left and the new system of land titling was implemented? Yes, yes, especially those who married local uh, local women. Kasi yun yung isa sa mga requirements ng Spanish colonial government and later the American uh, government no, uh, for them to 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 have a uh, title of Lorenzo to Lorenzo titles. No so parang uh, uh yung pag pagpapakasal nila with local with Filipinas ay way nila din to stay and at the same time to be able to acquire lands officially. So may, meron. 
uh, makita natin to limbawa sa kaso ng Palawan. Maraming mga Chinese na giniport sa Palawan and later on makakapag-asawa ng mga natives sa Palawan and they would acquire uh, lands doon sa, doon sa area. Alright, eh, uh, Prof. Paris, this question. Were all Chinese criminals male and have there been cases of Chinese women criminals as well? Wala, sir. Lahat sila ay mga lalaki. No? Uh, uh, of, one reason is that uh, nandun yung Confucian view na ang, ang, ang pwede lang lumabas no, ng China ay male. Male, male Chinese no? yung domestic affairs yung family affairs within within the within the household ang may hawak na ng babae so nag nag stay yung mga female Chinese sa sa China no? yung mga lalaki yung aalis at maghahanap ng greener pastures at least sa case yan ng ng Pilipinas no uh, kap, uh, ang 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 pattern was that may mga instant Karamihan sa mga papasok ng mga Chinese sa Pilipinas ay mga solteros, mga bachelors, no? Pero may mga instances din na meron silang asawa na sa China, pupunta sila sa Pilipinas, mag-asawa ng Pilipina bilang mga second wives, wives nila. So parang meron meron silang parang multiple families, no? may meron silang isa sa sa China tapos meron silang isa sa 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 Pilipinas. No? Pero kadalasan yung gumagawa ng ganun yung mga mayayamang Chinese. Sa mga lower class Chinese, usually wala silang wala silang asawa. No? At kapunyari sa mga at least dito sa pinag-aralan ko kapag uh, nam namatay kunyari na mahirap yung tao na yan kasi walang family dito, walang asawa, ang nagpapalibing sa kanya ay yung Chinese community. So, meron social civic organization sa Manila na sila yung nag, nag, uh, namamahala doon sa funeral, sa burial, na namatay na Chinese. This is, uh, I think, unique sa Pilipinas. Yung karamihan ay lalaki. Uh, lahat ay lalaki lang. No? Sa, ibang, sa ibang areas ng Southeast Asia, kasi uh, for instance, sa Malaysia or sa Singapore, meron yung mga female Chinese na makapasok particularly yung mga prostitutes at mga mga ayas mga nanis mga nanis sa Pilipinas wala akong na encounter pero sa Singapore and Malaysia may mga Chinese prostitutes mga akus ang tawag sa kanila at mayroong mga ayas mga mga nanis na magiging mahalaga din halimbawa pag pasok ng mga British kasi gusto ng mga British na mga Cantonese yaya na no? mag-aala doon sa mga ano. Sa Pilipinas, wala akong encounter. Dadami lang actually yung mga female Chinese, ethnic Chinese pagdating na ng mga 1920s, 1930s. No? Noong nag, nawala na yung dynasty sa China, no? kasi 1911, 1912, wala na yung, nag-end na yung Qing dynasty kasi meron pa ng Republican. So I think yung shift na yon ay may impact din doon sa migration no yung gender dimension ng migration ang hirap naman ng mga tanong mga geographers ah <laughs> uh, at maganda naman sir na naipaliwanag ng mabuti at sa enlightenment din ng lahat ng uh, nagtanong at nag-comment din sa among our audience i uh, would there be other questions o kaya ay uh, komento um, Sir Jelly, actually, um, we uh, somebody asked kung paano daw ba maaari. Isa ay makakuha ng kopya ng yung uh, articles. Pangalawa ay kung gusto nila na after the session ay to keep in touch with you and siguro um, send you emails, uh, would it be possible to share your email address or paano ba kanila ikaw malalapitan? How would they reach you? Yes, yes. Uh, paano ko i-email? Pwede kong email yung kopya kay Sir Joseph siguro kung sino man sa geography yung, yung paper. Pwede kong i-send yung dalawa na article na, 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 na publish ko tungkol dito sa uh, deportees. Tsaka yung tanong kanina ni Basil yung tungkol sa Benguet. Meron din akong article tungkol sa mga Chinese miners sa Benguet. Kung baka interested din kayo. Pwede kong i-send yung two, two articles kay Sir Joseph siguro or kay, kay Ma'am Oni or... Yeah. Baka yeah. Jelly, Jelly, pwede siguro natin gawin. 
para hindi lang nakasentro sa akin. Uh, <clears throat> kasi alam naman ito ng karamihan sa nag-register dito. <clears throat> Meron kasi kaming website kung saan namin ina- nilalagay ito sa UPD Geography. Uh, .blogspot.com uh, i-edit na lang namin doon yung publicity material mo tapos ipasok yung link sa dalawang articles para para ayun punta na lang nila yung naka-record ito sir no yung naka-record isa kasi, uh-huh. yung isa kasi ay open access uh, publish ito ng uh, Kyoto Kyoto University sa uh, Center for Southeast Asian Studies yung minors pero yung isa kasi ay kailangan kong humingi ng permission. So, kunyari, hindi ko sinabi. No? But, uh, kunyari, you can, you can email me na lang para i-send ko yung isa. Yung isa kasi may bayad yata. Kaya, baka magkaroon ng issue. So, yung isa, Kapag, then, yung yung mining, baka, yung mining, pwede kong i-send doon sa blogspot. Yung isa ay pwede i-email ko. Baka pwede mong iwan yung email mo address sa Zoom chat. <laughs> para ah, okay, okay, okay. makuha nila. Yeah. Okay. Kaya ako na lang siguro, alam ko naman ang email. <laughs> Ayan. Sige po, you might have other comments pa from the audience. Kung uh, interested response, kayo sa, sa Chinese in the Philippines, yeah, pwede tayo mag-usap even after this, this, uh, this lecture. Basil is raising his hand. Sige, Basil, hello. Uh, hello, sir. Um, medyo broad lang na tanong, but um, what did the other European colonial powers think about um, Spain's policy about the Chinese? Per, siguro in general na lang po ito. Kasi diba, they always, wel- they welcomed all the parang very cheap labor. It's like sa Malaysia, yung mga tin mine, pinapasok din naman Chinese. Sa Indonesia, they just allowed the Chinese to um form under yung parang kapitan China yung pating tawag doon yung mga leader ng mga Chinese communities what did the <laughs> british the dutch think about the spanish policy towards the chinese which was much more restrictive um uh, hindi ko na isip pa yan uh, hindi at paano ba nila tinignan yung mga policies nila. Uh, 19th century kasi lumalakas ang mga British and other foreign powers sa China. Pero sa kaso ng, 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 ng Spain, humihina naman yung Spain. Specifically, uh, di ba may, may meron kang 1872 na, na na ang tawag dito, yung execution ng gumbursa 1880s meron kang reform movement and then uh, 1895 meron kang Cuban Revolution 1896 Philippine Revolution so uh, from the point of view at least ng mga British uh, and in relation also sa, sa coolie trade no? coolie ang tawag doon sa mga cheap ano, cheap inexpensive Chinese labors na pinapadala no Oh, pupunta sa iba't ibang bahagi ng, ng mundo after makuha ng mga British um, ang Hong Kong noong uh, 1843. Uh, para sa kanila, uh, umihina. Umihina yung Spain. So, understandable na kailangan mas maghigpit. Hindi na actually sa mga Chinese, kundi maghigpit din sa mga Pilipino in general. It is as a colon- colonized population in general. So, uh, from the point of view of the British, understandable yung paghihigpit ng, ng mga, mga Espanyol kasi may mga uh, internal challenges kung baga, no, na, na kinakaharap yung, yung Spain sa, sa Pilipinas. Considering also the fact na pagdating ng 1820s, majority of Spain's former colonies in Spanish America had already staged independence revolutions. Pagdating na 1830s, tatlong colonies na lang ang hawak ng, ng Spain. Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. The, the rest, y- y- pagdating ng 1820s, lah- halos lahat ng mga Latin American colonies nila, wala na sa kanila. Mexico, Nicaragua, lahat yan nawala sa kanila. Except yung dalawa, Puerto Rico and Cuba. And in, in, in the Pacific, Philippines. No? 
at yung Cuba mag-stage mag, mag ng revolution 1895. Mas nauna sila sa atin ay isang taon. 1896 Philippine Revolution. Puerto Rico, hindi sila nag-stage ng revolution. Na, nakuha lang sila ng, ng, ng US because of the Treaty of Paris ng 18, 1898. So, kumbaga, parang, parang takot, takot yung mga Espanyol no, na mawala pa itong Pilipinas sa kanila. So, they had to talagang stricter policies. Hindi lang sa mga Chinese, pero sa sa colonized population in India kasi baka tatlo na lang follow sa mawala pa sa kanila wala na sa sa saan sila kuha ng revenue nila very general very broad goal uh, all right salamat thank you sir salamat sir Jelly and salamat din sa mga active participants natin dito sa ating Zoom um now we can move on to the next part of our program So please allow me to read the certificate uh, uh, that we are giving our speaker for uh, this uh, evening. Um, the certificate of appreciation is given to our speaker, uh, Prof. Jelly Galang, for the valuable insights and expertise shared as virtual uh, resource speaker for the talk, Chinese Criminals and the Frontier in the 19th century Philippines as part of the Hia Geo Lecture Series 2023 uh, held today, uh, November 10, 2023. This is signed by uh, Professor Joseph Pagis, the Chair of the Department of Geography, and Professor Emmanuel Garcia, uh, the President of the Philippine Geographical Society. Muli, Sir Jelly, uh, kahit ang dami mong ginagawa, <laughs> ay salamat sa pagpapaunlak sa amin, sa aming invitation. Salamat sure. din sa ating mga sa ating mga attendees no, for their active participation. Maraming maraming salamat Geography Department no? Sir Joseph sa 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 invitation na uh, I think in, para sa akin itong mga itong activities hindi siya actually parang burden pero kumpara para sa akin mas diversion pa nga tong tutusin kasi meron ka ng routine eh so, pero pag may ganitong ganitong classy ng invitation ay eh, parang it, bago para sa akin. At the same time, parang nahasa pa din yung mga tanong niyo for instance, oh, hindi ko pa naisip yan. Like yung question ni Basil about the British view on 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 Spain, hindi ko pa naisip yan. So, I think it's still, kumaga, I, I'm still learning and I still have a lot of, of of things to learn and thank you for the invitation, thank you for your questions and comments. Uh, let's continue talking. Yeah. No? I think yes. ito, yung, ito yung mahalaga, hindi tayo dapat nag-i-end sa dito. Uh, maray pang dapat uh, pag-usapan, maray pa tayong dapat palali. So thank you so much uh, sa, sa inyong lahat. Salamat sir. And uh, please note na Sir Jelly actually put his uh, email address. So for those who would like to continue this conversation through email in which uh, Prof. Galang, nandito ang kanyang email address sa chat box. And so now for our closing remarks, uh, I'd like to call on the Chair of the Department of Geography, Prof. Joseph Pat. Thank you very much, Oni, and thank you very much, Dr. Jerry Galang, for that wonderful, insightful uh, talk that you gave to us. It's not often that we invite uh, historians, but when we do, it's always um, uh, an occasion for us to re-examine our own discipline as well. I'm just going to comment on three things, and some of these are actually... Um, has historical parallels. It seems that the uh, frontier uh, issue that you mentioned uh, also harks back to the time when most British who are considered criminals were dumped in what is known as Australasia at the time uh, to work as laborers, which of course also tells you a different kind of frontier. The place was unexplored, pretty much like the frontiers in the Philippines. As you said, uh, there the Spanish control is not much in those areas, now, but in case of, of, of those present-day Australians whose forefathers worked gainfully uh, because of their <clears throat> of their association with the criminal world um, uh, that was very uh, that was a very unexplored territory also I'd like to 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 show another parallel the inability to pay taxes would make one a criminal um, and, and there's a lot of things that are happening as well in the country, but in particular, the one that happened in the 1980s in the UK, when former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher imposed what is known as a poll tax, P-O-L-L tax, where you have to register as a voter 
uh, you have to pay your taxes in order for you to vote, which of course resulted to a lot of upheavals from later on the punk group, you know, other people who were resisting those kinds of hegemonic practices. And I find that really interesting to compare with the Chinese uh, uh, in the Philippines who self-declare as working class, but who are still um, uh, demanded to pay taxes by the, by the Spanish government. But also finally, I'd like to, to mention the fact that Chinese are really seen as property, aren't they? They, they, they were just seen as uh, uh, disposable uh, um, goods, if goods is the right name to call them, by the, the Spanish conquistador during that time. But uh, they are seen as property. And I was struck with a particular tidbit that you mentioned about even just one missing Chinese they will have to find in order for... what. Well, Precisely because it's still valuable labor, you know, and a host of other things. So, so those were the things that I learned from your talk, and I'm so grateful to be able to witness and to see this unfold. Um, I will definitely uh welcome that article that you mentioned that that I I will look online. So thank you very much, Dr. Galang, and uh, here's the future collaboration between history and geography. Thank you. Oh. I'm not done yet. That's right. Um, it has a different title now. Uh, Edward Nadorata from UC Irvine is going to give a talk uh, to uh, the Hio Jiu lecture on December 6th. And the title that was written there is not the correct one. Um, it's entitled Racial Capitalism, Care in the Global Filipino Condition, Interrogating Risk and Contagion in the Philippines and its Diaspora, during COVID-19. Edward Nadorata is from University of California, Irvine, a Filipino-American who is presently gathering data for his dissertation in the Philippines. And we have more for, for we already have a, a, uh, um, a list of speakers that uh, until uh, June of 2024 and a few more that we will schedule soon. Anyway, thank you. We have uh, uh, a deadline for this, which happened uh, um, November 6th. And maybe some of you submitted your abstracts, maybe not. But we're going to have our International Conference in Geographical Studies, ICGS 2023, happening on the 24th and the 25th of November. I'm not sure, Jelly, if you're around because you are supposed to be in Bataan at the time for the faculty conference, but there's no geography department representative in that in that uh, <laughs> conference because we are all here for the ICGS 2023. The theme is performative geographies, specialities of embodiment, performance, ideology, and practice. And we have so far um, <clears throat> accumulated quite a wonderful list of abstracts that talk about various intersections with performance, performativities, and geographies. They're happening. Uh, the deadline is long uh, past, uh, but uh, we will be sending you uh, details about the conference if you can make it should be an interesting one especially for the geographers among us who are in this conference because this might be one of the few times where in there will be a lot of scholars geographers and geography adjacent scholars who will be sharing the work with many of us so thank you for letting me speak about this Right. Thank you, Sir Joseph. And if you want to uh, preview or watch again uh, the previous uh, sessions of our HIA Geo, um, please visit the uh, YouTube channel of the UP Department of Geography. Um, you can also uh, look at our other social media websites for updates no, on the activities that uh, we will be planning and conducting in the coming days. <laughs>